I read to you this portion of scripture because God sets a principle in motion at the very beginning of creation. The Bible says that God looks on the earth and darkness is upon the entire earth. The word darkness in the original language means this, misery, destruction, death, sorrow, and wickedness. That's where we are right now in America. And not only in America, but across the world. We see nothing but sorrow and misery. And there are suicides at an all-time rate. And addictions at an all-time rate. And perversion is out of control. And good is called evil. And evil is called good. And the hope of humanity is being squashed out. And when God looks on the earth, he sees that. And the Bible says that God looks at the darkness and he named it. And he said, you are no longer called darkness, but he said, I call you night. Darkness is not something, it's the absence of something. Darkness is not a substance. It just means that there is no light. When God looks on the earth, there is no light. But the Spirit of God moves. And when God moves, He looks at darkness. Because darkness is perpetual. There's no end to it. And what God wanted to do required an end to darkness. The only way that He could end it was He had to take authority over it. And the way He took authority over darkness was He said, I name you. And when He spoke the word, He said, You are no longer darkness, but He said, I call you night. And when God named darkness night, He declared that darkness had to come to an end. And that a day would dawn now that would bring light into the atmosphere. And immediately God said, let there be light. And that light began to shine upon the earth and misery and sorrow and death and wickedness began to flee for the far corners to hide themselves from the face of God. God, when he named darkness night, he declared that no longer is it death and sorrow, but he said, this is what it literally means. It means a protective shadow. That's what night means. See, night is not the absence of light. It just simply means it's not quite as bright. And so God set in motion that. And then the scripture says in the first chapter, verse 16, he says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser night to rule, or the lesser light to rule the night. After God made night, the Bible says that God created the moon. To rule the night. Whatever you name, you now rule. And when God made the moon, he said, I need something to rule when there's not as much light as there is in the day. But it's still under control, so God made the moon. Theologians all believe this, that the moon is a type of the church. What God was saying that when it looks like there's not a lot of light, that I'm going to put the moon over the night time and the night cannot do what it wants, but it's now under authority and something else rules it. Right now, what you and I are witnessing in our nation and in the earth is a battle between good and evil. A battle between God rule and darkness rule. 
Globalism, which we are being trying to be forced into, is where you take away all of the rights of the individual for the sake of a global government to be successful. But see, God never took away man's choice. God wants us to serve him because we love him, not because we are demanded to. And God raised up in the earth something called the church. And see, the moon does not radiate light. It does not have any light of itself. You know, when the moon gets its light, it reflects the light of the sun. The church, hallelujah, is not its own light. The church is only successful when it reflects the light of Jesus Christ. And whenever you have an eclipse in the spirit, in the natural, an eclipse is where the earth gets in between the sun and the moon. And it puts out the light from the sun and the moon goes dark. There is an eclipse going on right now in the spirit realm where the earth, the world, has gotten in between the church and God. And when you let the world get in between God and the church, the church becomes dark. And when darkness rules over the earth, sorrow and death and misery and destruction get a hold of a nation until those of us that are older look and we cannot recognize the world that we live in. No wonder America's messed up. We let the world get in the church. We embraced everything that was ungodly. We took prayer out of our church. We got rid of the altars. We got rid of the blood. We got rid of the cross. And we embraced the world until the church went dark. But when God moves the world out of the way, the church begins to reflect the light of the glory of God. And right now, saith the Lord, I'm getting ready to remove that which has stood between my and my church. Hallelujah. And there is a release of the anointing and of the glory of God. I bind the demon spirits in our government. I curse everything that's illegal. I loose the anointing of God upon our nation. I put inside of your spirit a boldness that says enough is enough. Let the church arise and radiate the glory of God. So what God did was he set a principle in motion that whenever whatever is named will be ruled by whatever names it. And that's why God named darkness because he then had the authority over it to rule it. And he changed it into a perpetual shadow. That's what the church is. We reflect the light of Christ that in a nation that has gone away from God, we are reflecting enough light in the earth that there is still hope. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, It says that, verse 19, says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. In fact, the word called them translates in the Hebrew named. That's one of its meanings. When God looked at the darkness he named it so he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them or name them and whatever Adam named every living creature that was the name thereof why would God do this because God understood that for Adam to be successful in his environment 
He must have authority over the beasts. Why? Because the beasts were faster, stronger, cunning, quicker than Adam was. He could not match them on a natural level. And so if the beasts were not under authority to Adam, then the beasts could destroy Adam because he was much more gifted in the natural. So God brings them because he understands for Adam to have authority over the beasts, he has to name them. Because God knows whatever you name, you have authority over. So he brings the animals to Adam, and he waits to see what Adam will name them. And when Adam began to speak, hallelujah, he was speaking out of the nature of God. Why? Because the Bible says Adam was made in God's likeness and in his nature. And so God did not want to get rid of the beast, but he wanted them to be subservient to Adam because the earth was not made for the beast. The beasts were made for man. And so God looks at Adam and he waits and Adam begins to operate out of the nature of God. And he looks at things that in the natural should have great success over him or have the ability to destroy him. But Along comes the cobra, and Adam names it. And the moment he named it, the cobra is under the authority of Adam. Here comes the gorilla that is many, many times much stronger than Adam. And yet Adam looks at him and names him, and immediately he is under the authority of Adam. Spiritually, God is putting it... A principle and a revelation in here because uh, God understood that in the spirit realm that we are dealing with a beast nature in our nation. In fact, Revelations brings it all the way down to that there will come a day when the Bible says there will be a mark of the beast. Jesus, the very first time that he begins to have an encounter with Satan, the Bible says that he is in the wilderness doing battle with Satan and with wild beasts. The last Adam had to take authority over the beasts, just like the first Adam did in the book of Genesis. Paul said this, I fought with the beast at Ephesus. And what he was saying was, there is going to be a demonic nature get loose in man's creation. That unless the church rises up and the believers rise up and name the beast, hallelujah, you will no longer have authority over it. The enemy has been smart because we have deteriorated to a society that we no longer believe in demons anymore. So we give them medical names. We don't want to call sickness what it really is, but we give it medical names. And that's why we have no success really in the medical profession is because we did not name it. it we let it name us. God is trying to bring back one of the things that you're going to see come back in the church is the casting out of demons. Alcoholism is not a weakness. It is a demon. Suicide is not a mental problem. It is a demon. Cancer is not something that's wrong with your body. It is a demon. Some of us need to rise up in the Holy Ghost and name it for what it is. I name hallelujah some of this stuff that come in the house of God as demonic. We cast it out in the name of Jesus. Because when you name it, you have authority over it. So whatever you name, in fact, in Revelations chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, there's going to come a day that death and hell will be given the ability to kill a fourth 
of mankind and one of the things that they will use to kill men with is beasts. Wild beasts. That's what Revelation says. So you have authority. You can command things. Remember a missionary years ago, I think it was in the Philippines, their baby was in a bassinet, and of course, you know, that homes are open then, and there were so many snakes all through that area, and the mama came in, and there was a huge poisonous snake in the bassinet crawled up on her baby. And she just remembered, and they shall take up serpents, and it shall not harm them. She went over there, she said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you. And she said, I picked that thing up, and it went limp like a dish rag. It did not coil up. There is an intimidation right now on God's people. There's an intimidation on prophetic voices in this hour that is making them backtrack. And listen, this church, I will never backtrack. I was raised around witchcraft. I was raised around demons. My, my father was a missionary in the inner reservation and on that small reservation they had a church called the Shaker Church and it was a mixture of Catholicism and witchcraft. I watched them do all kinds of black magic and different things. We woke up in the middle of the night and their whole church was in the middle of the street in front of my dad's house at two in the morning with lit candles and brass bells and they were pronouncing curses on our home. We did not understand back then those kind of, of things. And within a year, my dad at the age of 38 died at Christmas time through just a weird thing. So I can tell you by experience that the modern church, seeker-friendly churches, and a lot of these huge churches, they don't ever touch the demonic realm. They just have a little seeker-friendly gathering, and everybody comes together, but you're still bound by pornography, and you're still bound by unforgiveness, and you still got cancer. Marriages are being messed up, and children are hooked on drugs. This is a house of deliverance. You come in this house, hallelujah, and we have authority over cutting yourself. I have authority over demons. I have power over all the power of the enemy. You walk through the doors of regeneration, Nashville. There is liberty in the house. In fact, in the name of the Lord, I loose liberty on you right now. In the name of Jesus, he whom the Spirit has set free is free indeed. Whatever you are named defines who you are. I remember years ago, I went through the darkest time in my life. I had given up my church, went through a very difficult divorce. Um, I didn't have, I didn't, I was literally stripped down to where I was homeless. I wound up homeless in, the, in Nashville here. Slept in my car, had no money. My church was gone. I didn't have my son with me. And I felt like such a failure. And I was praying one night, and I told the Lord, I said, I am a failure. I have failed at pastoring. I have failed at marriage. I have failed as a father. I have no success. I am a failure. The next day, a pastor came to see some folks that I was sleeping on the floor of their house. And he saw me. He said, Brother Kent. I wasn't preaching at the time. I never quit serving the Lord. I just had no unction to preach. And he said, Brother Kenny, he said, I was praying for you. And he said, the Lord said to come tell you that you are not a failure. See, what was happening was the devil was trying to name me. Because if he could name me failure, I couldn't stand today on the platform of Regeneration Nashville and tell you you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loves you. And the enemy right now is trying to name so many of God's people. He's trying to name our church. He's trying to name our nation. So for all of you out there that keep telling me that the prophets missed it, we did not miss it. God fulfilled his word. The problem is you are being... 
deceived by the enemy in thinking, well, whatever the natural says, that's what it is. Not so in the spirit. For it is not the natural that rules the spirit, but it is the spirit that rules the natural. So when God says enough is enough, he would just speak a word and he will bring into the natural what he's already declared in the spirit. Jesus understood the power of the name. In fact, God understood it all the way back to Genesis because when God began to prepare for the church, the Bible says that when John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, his daddy didn't get to name him. The angel named him. Now, it took Zacharias nine months to figure that out. (laughs) And until he was willing to say that his name is John, God zipped his mouth. The Bible said he could not speak until he understood the power of the name. And when, when he wrote down his name is John, God said, now you get to talk. And he opened his mouth and began to praise the Lord. When Jesus came on the scene, who is the image of the invisible God, his parents didn't get to name him. But an angel showed up and said, I got a message for you, Mary and Joseph. His name shall be called Jesus, for it is Emmanuel, and he shall save his people from their sins. No wonder there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus understood the name because he said one day, he said to his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? And his disciples said, well, some have named you John the Baptist. Some have named you Elijah. Some have named you Jeremiah. He said, but who do you think I am? They said, you're Christ, the anointed one. He said, you didn't get that in the natural. He said, the spirit of God revealed that to you. So Jesus is walking in that. He wants his disciples to understand who he is. Why was that so important? Because the Bible said Jesus is looking at the crowd that he's talking to I think it was Martha that we talked about last week. And he said, he named himself. He said, I am resurrection and I am life. What was he doing? He saw the future would require him to be called resurrection. Why would he not be satisfied with the name John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah? Because he saw with the exception of Elijah that these people were going to die or they did die. And he realized that where I'm going, I need to come back to life. So he said, you can't call me a prophet. You can't call me a teacher. He said, you got to call me resurrection and life. And that's why after three days when death ruled over the tomb, uh, that Jesus came out of the grave. Why? Because he lived up to what he named himself. You can either let hell name you or you can name yourself in the Holy Ghost uh, that I am Christ. No wonder when Jesus looked at you and I, the Bible said he named us. If any man be in Christ, I name him a new creation. Hallelujah. All things pass away and all things become new. That's why I do not accept the doctor's report. I do not accept, hallelujah, your credit report. I do not accept what men say over this house for 14 years. Because today I'm looking, hallelujah, at a regeneration of something brand new. Listen, when God resurrects 
something. He doesn't bring back what was, but he releases what has never been by the power of the Holy Ghost. I hear the sound of the Holy Father beginning to release something in the Spirit by the power of God. Adam ruled over everything because he named it. The problem right now, and I can tell you this with great conviction, destinies are being determined right now in the earth. I just feel a, such a quickening in the Holy Ghost. There are many of you right now that your destiny is being determined by what you call yourself. How you see yourself. Too many of us over the years have delayed our destiny because we've let the devil name us wounded, sick, offended, bitter. We let the enemy name us those things. And when you let the enemy name you offended, the Bible says it's easier to win somebody to the Lord that's never been saved than to win somebody back to Christ that's been offended because it gets so down in your spirit and you become so offended at what other brothers and sisters and pre- Do you know how many people don't go to church today because of what a preacher did to them? But see, I refuse to let somebody offend me to the point that I step out of step with God and I become out of joint. Because for you and I, we don't get to pick our judgment. As much as I love you or I dislike you, I don't have to answer to you on judgment day whether I go to heaven or not. Nobody gets to pick where you spend eternity but Jesus. So that's the only one I have to worry about. Doesn't matter what men say, it matters what God says. I could tell you this that if the devil can name you, he has authority over you. You don't think the power of what you say of yourself is important? How many have ever heard a teen challenge that Prophet David Wilkerson raised up? It's all over the world. It's in so many nations. The success rate of teen challenge is over 90%. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous uses biblical foundation. They're considered a Christian group. The success rate of Alcoholics Anonymous who believes in the Bible and Jesus is less than 10%. How can that be? I can tell you exactly how it is. Because when you walk in, the first thing they make you do is say, Hi, I am an alcoholic. Don't matter if you've been going for 10 years. You have to stand up and say, I am. My name is Bob, and I am an alcoholic. You have just named yourself an alcoholic. If any man be in Christ, what you need to do, David Wilkerson's group said, you stand up and you say, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things pass away, and all things become new. You may have been hooked on pornography. You may have been an alcoholic. You may have been a heroin addict. But when Jesus gets a hold of you, he renamed you a brand new man in Christ Jesus. I don't care what your pedigree is or how messed up your family tree is when the blood the blood the blood gets inside of your spirit God changes you and you are not what they said you were if you do not name yourself before crisis then crisis will name you 
If you are waiting to get in the battle to determine who you are, you've already lost. When I go into battle with the enemy, I'm not going in with the paradigm of, I hope I can win. I'm going into the conflict knowing that the battle has already been decided. Just how much pain and authority do I want to inflict on my enemy? It is so imperative. There are so many Christians today that have let their past define their future and name them. Whether it's a bad marriage or how your parents treated you or you were sexually abused by somebody that should have protected you or you were raised in poverty and you've never had anything. I was raised very poor. When my dad died, my mom was 34 and I was 12 and she had never had to have a job and she had $600 a month coming in from um, veterans. My first bicycle I got at 5 o'clock every morning, seven days a week before school, and I delivered papers so I could buy a bike from Western Auto for $7 a month. <clears throat> and what happened over the years, I fought so much failure. I couldn't make the basketball team because I was short. I started out in ministry, and uh, I wasn't as perhaps polished or as knowledgeable, but I was anointed as a young man, and I, I fought a lot of rejection. It wasn't church people didn't like me. Preachers didn't like me. <laughs> and I went through that for years, the rejection and, and so much stuff. And I didn't know it, but I let the enemy name me. And so when you let the enemy name you, you're sealing out yourself. And you always think, I used to make statements like, well, if anything bad can happen, it will happen to me. Or, well, it happens for everybody else, but it will never happen for me. You know what I was doing? I was letting the devil name me and curse me with my own mouth. Some of the greatest achievers that have shaped the destiny of mankind, nobody would have ever picked. Catherine Kuhlman, she said, I was God's fourth choice. A.A. A. Allen, who God used in a tremendous way at the age of two, was already hooked on moonshine because his parents would give him moonshine and a baby bottle to keep him quiet from the revenuers in the woods of Kentucky so they would not hear him cry. Jack Cole was raised at an orphanage and was an absolute alcoholic by the time he was 17. But, oh, look what God did. Amen. Hallelujah. Look what God did. Do you not know that some of you that sit in this building that have never done anything for God. Now I'm preaching to you in the airways. Those of you who are sitting in your houses today and on your couches in the other countries. I want to encourage you by the power of God. Stop letting the enemy name you. Hallelujah. When you go to the doctor and the doctor comes out and says, I'm sorry, but you have cancer. The enemy just named you death with cancer. That's where you have to say, I don't receive that. Doesn't mean you have to be disrespectful to the doctor. You don't have to say anything to him. But when you walk out of there and you get in your car, you say this. I will not let the enemy name me with this because the Bible says by his stripes I am healed. So I name myself healed. Hallelujah. I no longer name myself a pastor over a hundred people but I name myself a pastor and a prophet to the nations. No longer are we going to bow down as some, some form of Christianity that's weak and emaciated but we are an army of God that the enemy's going to have to deal with in this nation that we will not bow down. We will not be silent. We will not be mute, but we are going to declare, if God be for us, nobody can be against us. (laughs) 
I want to give you an example of both sides of the coin very quickly. Y'all make me preach longer than I used to preach. Jesus looks at Apostle Peter and he says, you don't know it because you can't see it in yourself. But he said, the devil wants you really bad. He said, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. But he said, I want you to know that I've been praying for you. He said that he didn't say that you wouldn't fail, but he said that your faith will not fail. And he said, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. I think that's who the devil really wanted to betray Jesus was was Peter. So a little later on, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. He takes his disciples aside. He said, now, guys, he said, this is going to be a tough time. He said, and he, he starts talking in third person. He said, he didn't say, no, I'm going to be taken before the scribes. And what, he said, the son of man is going to be persecuted. And when he is, and, and um, he begins to talk about all the things. And the Bible said that Peter took him aside. He said, you don't need to be talking like that. I don't like that kind of stuff. Well, number one is because Peter figured it out. If Jesus is going to be persecuted, so am I. So he said, I want you to talk about raising the dead and taking the kingdom and getting rid of the Romans. And Jesus, in front of all the disciples, looked at Peter. He said, I rebuke you, Satan. You need to get behind me, for you savor not the things that be of God. Peter was a proud man, and he'd just been humiliated in front of all of his constituents. But somewhere Peter took it. And he yielded to, to the Lord there. And he, I guess he probably repented. Later on, we find the story where he is by the fire and he is now being accosted. And persecution seems imminent for him because he is a believer in Christ. And they begin to say, you're the one, you're the one, you're the one. And he said, I'm not... He became so adamant to save himself. The Bible says he began to curse and swear. He began to swear a curse over himself if he was one of Jesus' disciples. And as that came out of his mouth of denial, the enemy is sifting him. The rooster crows and he looks up because he remembers the words of Jesus. And across the courtyard, Jesus locks eyes with him. And Peter's heart smote him. And the Bible said he went out. And instead of falling into that, I hate Jesus, I don't know him. The Bible said he fell on his face. And he began to repent. How did that happen? Because when Jesus rebuked him in front of all the disciples and the devil came to name him offended, Peter named himself repentant. And when crisis came to destroy his soul, what he named himself rose up. And he fell on his face and he began to weep. And he repented. Now the other side of the coin is the oldest disciple is Judas. It's prophesied that there would be one that would betray Christ. But it wasn't Judas who was predestined for that. So there's one day that... Mary comes in with this very expensive ointment and begins to anoint Jesus right before crucifixion. And Judas looks at that and he looks at Jesus. He said, you need to stop her because that, that's a waste. 
That needs to be sold in the money given to the poor. The Bible said it's not that he cared about the poor, that he was a thief. And he carried the bag. And what he saw was, that's money that I could put in my pocket. What the world calls waste, God calls worship. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.